Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. In this video I would like to introduce you to Command, which is a new open source, so fully free, lightweight .NET library that helps you implement CQRS and the mediator pattern in your .NET applications. So if you want to understand how you can start using right now commands, queries, validators and interceptors, stay tuned because I will show you exactly how you can achieve all these things with some very specific code samples. But before we get started with that, I just want to make a few clarifications about command. Now, as you might know that I co-founded a business for which I am the CTO, and that's why we needed to build our product. And we have started to build, or I have started to build this product out for quite some time. Like I would say it's already three months. This context is important because the product that we're building, it's not really a simple CRUD application. And even though it won't be 100% microservices, we have some different components or moving blocks in our ecosystem. And I had this need that I want to have simple CQRS type of implementations, but in several different places. So I created an internal library for us that we were just kind of like importing the project and just reusing that so that we can simply just have these commands, queries, validators, interceptors in all the different, let's say, projects or building blocks that we have in our entire system. Then I had a discussion and people suggested, okay, but hey, why not open source it? So I was thinking about it and uh, yeah, I, to, to be honest, I was very worried and didn't really want to do this initially because, well, let's see that there are a lot of sustainability problems in the open source ecosystem, at least in, in the .NET area. And that's why I want you to understand that the library that I'm presenting to you, command, it's not simply that I kind of like want to simply just create something that it is a replacement for something else. It's just that we had internally this idea and it needed, we wanted some clarity and we wanted internal ownership. So that's why we've built this library. I'm not kind of like building this library as a side project that I have to maintain and work on it after hours. It's part of my regular work. And on the other hand, I really don't have any commitments or I don't make any commitments that I will always solve all the problems that, 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 that you might notice or raise in issues right away. And in fact, if you go to the repository of this library, you will see that everything is mentioned and stated there very, very clearly. So I think that this sets a very solid and healthy foundation for having an open source library that could be useful for some of you. This being said, I guess we talked a lot about this, but really that needed some clarifications. So let's move over to the code and let me show you exactly how the different building blocks of this command CQRS library fit together. So here I am now in my IDE. What we can see here is that we have this concept of commands, which is for instance, this create product command, which is a very, very simple record that implements this I command interface. So one thing that, that I wanted to have is this also semantic, but also technical, as you will see a little bit later, distinction between a, a command and a query. Because I really missed that in other libraries. And I think that this is an important distinction and we will see also why just in a few minutes. That's why I have this I command. And then I have, for instance, queries where we need to implement this I query. For instance, for the user query, we get this get user by ID query, which gets a user. So it's I query of user. Both of these interfaces for I query and I command also have non-generic interfaces in case you don't want to return anything. Now in behind there is an I request interface and we will see just in a few minutes why that I request interface might be or where exactly that I request interface might be important. But generally we want to make this distinction. Besides these queries and commands, we also have this concept of notifications. The idea is that we have here, for instance, this product created notification. So when we have, when something happens in our application, we can just simply send out an information that, hey, a new product was created. And obviously for that one, we can then register handlers that would execute and do specific or perform specific tasks based on the information that's contained in this specific specification. Now, I wanted to show you both these commands, queries, and, not and, and notifications because the next step is obviously for all of those, we need handlers. So we have here a handlers folder and I've structured it like product common handlers. So here is the command handler for creating the product where I simply inject an I repository that's just an in-memory repository in this case. And I inject the I mediator. We'll see exactly how you can use the I mediator from the minimal API endpoint. We know that this is a command handler because we implement this interface, I command handler, where we specify the command and we specify the return type. 
And based on that, it actually simply works like all the other similar libraries. When the application starts up, it will match together what command or what handler needs to be executed for what command. So in handle async method is basically where all the logic happens. So it's, it's where you would place your entire application level logic or application level orchestration. For instance, in this case, we just want to create a new product. We use the repository to add the pr uh, product async, and then we use the mediator to publish async, and we, pub and, and we publish this new product created notifications that we did take a look at it just a few minutes ago. And obviously, also the notification handlers are all wired up when the application starts up. So right now, what will, what, what will happen, obviously, is that, uh, well, the handler will be executed. As in other libraries, the main difference between a command or a query handler and, uh, and the notification handler is that for the command or the query handlers, for each command or query, you will have just one handler that will ever be executed. For the notifications, you can have one notification, but you can have potentially several different handlers that will get executed when that specific notification happens. Now, I wanted to also show you this other updated product handler, because in this updated product handler, the main idea is that just we want to update the product, we still use the repository to update the product async. But then in this case, as you can see, when we have defined this update product command, it just implements I command. It's not the generic I command of T response. So it means that we are actually not expected to return anything, but from async methods, we are expected to, well, return something. And what we usually do is kind of like, or the default kind of like recommended implementation that I use is to return this unit.value. And unit is just a default return type that represents a void task. Now let's take also a look at some user queries. And here is, for instance, where I have this uh, get user by email query handler, which is a iQuery handler that will be triggered on the get user by email query, and it will, it will return a nullable user. And what we do is we just use the repository, we get the user and return it. Now I want to get into another concept in the command library that's very important to me, and that's kind of like a distinctive feature that you usually don't see by default, is the idea that we have validators. So by default, when you register validators, and here is, for instance, a validator for the create product common validator. And we can notice that it's, it's a validator for that comment because it's implemented, it, it implements this a validator interface that has a generic type param that represents the comment that we want to validate. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this is that I really miss that a lot. And I genuinely think that in applications, it's very important to understand that we have different validation scopes. Now, we have a certain validation, for instance, when a request comes in at the API endpoint, we just need to validate that the fields that, that we wanted to have are in the correct format. But then there is application level specific validation. For instance, if you want to register a new user, you want to make sure first that that user doesn't exist in the database. So this is, from my point of view, a totally different validation scope. And I always struggle to understand where exactly to put this type of validation that needs also to maybe, well, look into the database, look or make an HTTP call to get some information from elsewhere in order to kind of like define if that specific operation is valid in that application. And it was always very difficult for me to find exactly where to place this code. Now, in this case, I wanted to make this simple. So I have this I validator. You just create a validators. And if you register commands so that it supports also validation, those validators will automatically be added to that specific handlers. So it means that whenever the handler for the create product command is about to trigger, the validation will run first. So we can then just return early if we have a validation problem and then return a problem detail, for instance, to the calling clients or whatever or however we want to handle that specific scenario. But it's just as simple as that. You have an iValidator interface and you need to implement this validate async method. Now, this is by default an async because this application level type of validation usually also requires interaction with databases, HTTP endpoints, APIs, other services. So it's usually where you will actually need to make some async calls. And that's why it's an async method. And here we have a lot of different validation. We validate the name. For this one, obviously, we don't need any database. We validate the SKU strictly from how the strings look like and so on. But then, for instance, as you can see here, we have an async check. 
which we want to make sure that that SKU doesn't already exist in the database before we actually add it. And if it exists, we can just simply add an error to our validation error list, and we can simply then just return that to the caller, and they can then decide how exactly they would like to handle that. Now, one important thing to notice here is that we do not return early. Because one thing that I really hate in a lot of circumstances is, or I, I had this in practice, for instance, when calling some API endpoints for third-party applications, I was doing a call and I it returned to me that, hey, I don't know, you specified your username in a wrong format. Okay, cool. So I then specified the username in the correct format, made the call, and then I kind of like received back another error that, hey, the full name is also not in expected format, for instance. And that's crazy. So I want to have this experience that if kind of like I want to validate something at application level, I want the consumer, the client of my validation, know all the things that went wrong in that specific validation, because that might help actually developers and even programmatically kind of like define exactly how you want to recover from that and what you want to do. So that's why we don't return early from validators, but we go through everything and we pile up any type of validation errors, and then we just return basically a list of validation errors that then the consumer can consume and do or implement some logic based on what it finds there. Validation is, however, not the only concern that we have. So when we execute this type of request, then handler, so we do something in a handler and then we return a response, there are a lot of other cross-cutting concerns that, me, that, that, that we might want to add to our handlers. And obviously, I don't really want to clutter the handler or the handle async method with this type of third or cross-cutting concerns. So that's why in command, we have the concept of interceptor. And for instance, here we have this logging interceptor. And you can see here that this logging interceptor is just kind of like, okay, it implements this I interceptor interface of T-request and T-response. But then you see that where we specify the constraints, we say that it's kind of like the T-request inherits from I-request. And that's an important thing. And this is, or I want to emphasize this because it's, a distinctive feature of this command library, I would say, is that you can have interceptors that will be triggered on all types of requests. So no matter if you have a query or if you have a command, if you have this logging interceptor, that one will execute. But then what we can do is also have only interceptors that get triggered or get, that's, get executed when we have a command, but not when we have a query. So in this case, it's basically I command handler or I command interceptor. And we see this here that command obviously inherits I command. So we see that it's I command interceptor. And in this case is I interceptor. And for the query or the caching, let's imagine that we want to add caching. We have I query interceptor. So you see, that's why I, I, I told you in the beginning that I preferred to actually have a distinction between query and commands because there are some things that I would like to execute or to perform when I have a query, but there are some other things that I would like to execute when I have a command. And there might be some things that I want to execute no matter if I have a command or a query. Now that we have looked at the different implementation and the different functionalities, I just want to show you how everything is wired up together. And for that, I'm here in my program.cs file. And here it's the configuring this command library is something very easily actually. So we just have this builder services and then add command, which takes in a configuration object. In the configuration object, following familiar patterns, you have this register handler from assembly, where you can just specify an assembly that will, well, register the handlers, but also the interceptors that belong to specific handlers, or if they are query interceptors or common interceptors, everything will be registered in our DI so that we can use it on the subsequent requests. And then it's important to understand this idea of intercept. You need to add them manually. And the reason why you need to add them manually is because the order in which you add the interceptor matters. And to keep things very simple, I just wanted to make sure that we use a similar concept that we have in middleware. 
So it's exactly the same. When you have a handler that needs to be executed, before the handle async is executed, that specific command will go to all the interceptors that you have registered here in this specific order. So first it will hit this interceptor, then it will hit this interceptor, and then it will hit this interceptor. And last but not least, I have on the config this with validation. And this will add the validators to the entire pipeline. If you skip this, then validators will not be added. So even if you create them, if you don't have, if, if you don't call this with validation, then they will simply not be used. The idea or why I wanted to do this is because I can imagine there are scenarios where people just don't want to use our validators. They kind of like want to use their own validation or whatever they want to do. And I didn't want to have the computational overhead of searching for interceptors when you actually don't want to use them, obviously. So that's why I wanted to, 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 to give this as an opt-in. So if you want to have our validation systems and to work with it, you can just call with validation. If not, you can just simply omit this call and then we will not use our validation at all. And it will save you some memory usage and some CPU cycles. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is the open telemetry setup. Now, in our application or in our systems, we have everything under open telemetry and we do a lot of traces and metrics. We collect a lot of information so that we can know exactly what or how our system is doing. So I wanted that this command library that we initially used internally, I just wanted it to, well, simply tie in to what we already have. So that's why we have built in open telemetry instrumentation directly into the command. Now, the only thing that you need to do if you want to use our open telemetry, you need to add this with tracing and with metrics and add basically our trace source, which you need to specify exactly that specific name, command, and our meter, which is also, you have to specify the specific naming here. And last but not least, here we are where everything is wired up together. We define some endpoints and we have here some minimal API endpoints in this case. Here map user endpoints and here we just do the mappings. And then we just call static async methods basically when we hit a certain endpoint. And the only thing that we need to do is just inject the iMediator interface things that are very, very familiar to us. And then we just await mediator, then query async. And if we have, for instance, commands, we have mediator send async. Primary reason why I chose to have dedicated methods for query and for sending a command, like doing something that mutates state, is that I want to semantically make it very clear, both for human developers, but potentially also to AI agents, that we want to do two different types of things. Like either we want to carry something or we want to send a command that will mutate the state of our application. So yeah, I guess that's mostly it. This is how this command library works. I think it's a very simple one, very lightweight, but I think it kind of like caters for the most common use cases that we might have. As said, I will evolve this library based on the feedback, but also based on the needs that we have at Ethereum. And if I notice something that's not working properly, I will simply repair that. If I notice that I need another feature, I will simply add that specific feature and I will then kind of like do different releases. Right now, this command library is in pre-release, so it is in alpha. You can install it, but make sure if you do this via an interface, make sure that you have this pre-release che uh, checkbox checked so that also pre-release packages are shown to you when you search for command. If you have any type of idea or, or feedback, you are welcome to read, obviously, through the repository. We have a readme, we have a contribution guide, we, you can open issues there. So feel free to do that. And really any type of feedback, especially if you use this library, even if in your side projects or wherever you use it, any type of feedback is really welcome. If you are not already a subscriber to this channel, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and to subscribe to the channel right now and also hit the notification bell so that you are always notified when we have something new happening on the Cold Wrinkles channel. And if you just have a question or just want to get in touch with me, don't be shy and head over to the comment section, leave a comment below, and I'd be more than happy to get in touch with you. This being said, thank you very much for watching and until the next time, I wish you the very best.